the glory of the Lord. The glory of God. What an amazing, amazing essence of himself. What a wonderful part of him. Children, y'all welcome to go to Children's Church. What a wonderful thing. To be in the midst of the glory. Sister April, there is nothing I've found that compares to it. In the midst of the glory of God. Absolutely nothing compares. God spoke to me just a few short weeks ago. The word poor when I was writing a Christmas card to our different ministers of the church that are involved as far as youth pastor, children's pastor. I heard the word poor. And I told that particular minister, I said, that's going to be a word for you, for your ministry this year. Little did I know at that moment that it would be a word for the entire church. God began moving upon me and showing me that this word would hold a very high <clears throat> place in the vision for 2016 at New Haven Church of God. And so we've been looking at the story taken from 2 Kings chapter 4 of the widow who had lost her husband. He had been a member of the sons of the prophets. Through the writings of Josephus, we believe him to be Obadiah, who was in the house of Ahab and was responsible for saving many, many prophets from the wrath of the king. I had them to sing this song, It's Not Over, on purpose today because as we cover uh, the story of the woman, I want to emphasize the fact that it was not over for her or her children until God said it was over. Amen. Would you stretch your hand this way and let's believe God to anoint his messenger. Holy are you and great are you, Lord. Lord, I need your anointing now to speak into lives, God, in this building and beyond, across the globe, Lord, by means of internet. I ask, Lord, that you would minister to each one of them because only you know what they are going through and what they are facing. Lord, I commit this word to their hearts. And I pray that you will accompany the word with the move of the Holy Ghost so that it will be powerful and effective. Speak to us this hour, we ask. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 6. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. I can only imagine that people had written off this widow's chances of ever saving her sons from a life of servanthood. Many probably looked at her and said, why don't you spend the last few hours and maybe days if she were to have that long going fishing with your sons? Why not take them to the tabernacle? Why not go to a place, well, at this time it would have been the temple why not go to a place where that you can talk about uh, your heritage and make sure they understand about their uncles and aunts and grandparents why in the world would you take this time woman to waste by coming knocking on our door and taking vessels from our homes when there's nothing that they can do to benefit you but the people did not know the neighbors did not know what this widow knew and that was the fact that it is not over until God says it's over. Can I get an amen? amen? I love the story that to me parallels this situation to an extent involving Jairus, the synagogue ruler. I love among most, uh, almost every message I'm able to preach, I love this one of the most, or uh, one of the most stories I love to preach, Jairus, where that he came to Jesus and he was desperate because his daughter was at the brink of death. And we understand that he, uh, he was pleading with Jesus, would you hurry? Would you come to my home? My daughter needs a miracle. And in Luke chapter 8, verses 49 and, 40, 49 and 50, it says, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, speaking of Jairus, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. I don't uh, desire or attempt to change what Jesus said, but what I'm hearing in my spirit, man, is Jesus saying, Hey, Jairus, it's not over until I say it's over. Amen. Jesus would have the last word. Yes, and I want to ask you a question, and then we're going to move on. 
Because this is something you may be pondering for the rest of this day. What is it that God has spoken into your life that you've given up on? Ooh, I just felt him. Mm. Sometimes you feel like a dart going to somebody. I just saw it. Uh, thank you, Lord. What is it that God has spoken into your life maybe when you were a child and you've given up on it? Because God wants to remind you that he does not forget what he says. Amen. He does not forget the plans that he makes for you or the path that was prepared for you to walk. God makes sure that he, even if it takes a preacher in a small commercial building in Southside Alabama to remind you of it, he's going to remind you it's not over until I say it's over. Mm. Oh, glory to God. I feel so much power of the Holy Ghost today, I'm telling you. Reminds me of some revivals. <laughs> in Proverbs 16, verse 1 of the Message Bible, mortals make elaborate plans, but God has the last word. I'm an American preacher. I'm a preacher who speaks about our nation. I don't preach much about Africa or Asia or Europe because I don't live there. But I speak over America because it's where God allowed me to be born. Amen. And I've come to tell you it's not over for the United States of America until God says it's over. Amen. Mm. We are part of a nationwide prayer force. I met with our leaders last Sunday at 4, 4, 430. And I gave them out a sheet of a national prayer group. And every month there's specific things that Christians all over the nation are praying specifically for. And we're going to be a part of that. There's also the South Side Awakening that we continue to pray. And that I hope that you're, I haven't even, haven't even looked at the sheet out there in the foyer on the bulletin board, but I hope that you're signing your name to that to a certain day of the week that you're willing to pray over South Side, the schools, the uh, city hall, and all its employees. And on that day, you are to fast at least one meal. We began that last week, and I really Im implore you to become part of that. The more people we have praying, I believe, the quicker that sometimes God moves based on the unity of the people. Amen. Moving on from it's not over, I want to look at the next topic of overflow. Now, all of us are a little different. Can I get an amen? amen. But when I go through a drive through I don't like for, I don't like to have to pay a dollar seventy-five for a large Dr. Pepper, and then when I get it, all they did was fill it up to the top real quick to where it's fizzing and it looks full. And by the time I get pulled out on uh, Rainbow Drive, that it's now about three quarters full. I would prefer for them to sit there if it takes double the time, Brother Steve, and wait until the fizz goes down and fill that sucker up to the brink. <laughs> Amen. There's times when I go through the drive-thru and I know I'm going home to eat and to drink that I will tell them put no ice at all in it because that way I know I'm going to get a cup that's full to the top and when I get home I can add my own ice. Amen. How many of you have ever been irritated when you bought chips in the grocery store and you see a big old Doritos family size bag and you open it up and there's about 13 in the bottom. You're thinking what did they measure? Air? It bothers me when I think I'm getting one thing and I get another. When God moves, hallelujah, he's an overflow kind of God. There's a lot of things the world will offer you and you'll always feel a little bit shortchanged. But I have never felt shortchanged when God moved in my life. Whew. My Lord, Aaron, I just don't, I don't know. I feel like I'm talking about it too much, but I keep feeling the Holy Ghost. I think there's something supernatural about to be taking place in here. Some people said, I thought it already had. Well, it did, but more's coming. Woo, glory to God. My Lord, if the Holy Ghost takes over the mic, I won't mind. I'll sit down and listen. Praise God. Joel 2, 24, listen to what God promised us. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow. Somebody say overflow. overflow. <laughs> Ooh, glory. Overflow with wine and oil. The original jar from which the woman poured had a supernatural overflow. It poured more than it could hold. The woman's oil did not continue to flow beyond the limits of her pitcher until the need was met. See, God will not stop flowing through you for a specific thing until that thing is handled. You say, well, man, I quit praying about that for about 
three months ago, why is it I still feel pressured or I still feel like something God's got a breakthrough coming? It's because God has never quit sending that flow into you. He's saying, I'm going to keep flowing and moving and pressuring and pushing until you're willing to obey me so I can move that thing that I said I was going to move three months ago. See, God will not stop flowing until what he spoke has come to pass. So every time she lifted that pitcher and began pouring in a jar, God made sure that there was something to back up her faith. Listen to this right quick. If your prayers are always about you, then you need to change the way you pray. If the woman had only looked at that one picture and said, this is, this is it. It's all about this one picture. This is mine. The others belong to the neighbors. This one is mine and my son's. It's the one I need God to bless. If she had only looked at it that way, she would have never been able to pay off all her debt. But instead, she began realizing it's not all about my picture. Can I tell you today again, it's not all about us. Amen. What I found is when I quit praying about me and I start praying for you and for your family, sometimes I feel a greater move of the Holy Spirit than I've felt in about a week. When I come to this church and I start speaking the name of every family in New Haven Church of God, I feel the anointing begin to flow. And I'll tell you why. Because God didn't just fill us to make us feel good about ourselves or just to get healed or blessed ourselves. He flows in us so we will overflow into somebody else. And I give you my word and God's word that if you'll start praying for somebody else more than you pray about yourself, you'll begin seeing God do things in your own life quicker than he would have done before. He's an overflow kind of God. He's concerned about the needs of those around you. Can you imagine Jesus on the day that there were 5,000 men plus women and children sitting on the grass saying, does anyone have any food? And this boy comes up with five loaves of bread, two fish, <clears throat> probably a tilapia and a catfish. I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine them handing Jesus that basket and him saying, well, I'm the king. I'm the Lord. And he sits down. And you got people just starving. And he breaks the bread. He prays over it. Lord, thank you for this food. I love you, Father. He sits there and eats it and just stares at them. I mean, imagine that. Hey, hey, James, go get me some butter. Hey, somebody come get, go get me a glass of, of ice cold water. And he sits there and you've got 5,000 men that are about, they're about to riot because they're little kids sitting there going, Daddy, I'm hungry, Daddy. And Jesus is sitting there saying, just deal with it. Just deal with it. Aren't you glad Jesus did not do that? Aren't you glad before the Bible says Jesus ever took one bite that after he broke it, he gave it to the disciples? The Bible doesn't say he took one bite. It's mm, glory. It says he broke that bread. He put it in the basket. When the disciples started giving it out, made sure they were fed first before even Je Jesus was human. He was hungry. But he said, I'm not going to touch one morsel until everybody gets fed first. You know what one of the problems is with the church? Because we're so concerned about, my God, help me. We're so concerned about coming here, getting my Holy Ghost blessing, getting my chill bumps. I want to feel the thrill that I felt when I got saved. Well, that's fine, but here's the problem. We've forgotten about overflow. Because, see, God emphasizes overflow for the purpose of making you understand it's not about you. It's about the lost souls. It's about the broken. My God, I might preach right here. It's about the sick, the lame, those in prison, those who are in broken relationships, those who are abused. God God says, it's, you've had enough of your own blessing. It's time you overflow into somebody else so they can feel what you feel. we got to learn to overflow into others. The outpouring that is coming will be because you choose to let God overflow through you. John 7, verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. One thing that I love about rivers is that you can't control a river, especially when we're speaking on a spiritual level. I cannot control the flow of God when he comes like a river. You see, there's a lot of folks who wish there was an on and off valve, that they could turn on God and turn him off. When, oh, <laughs> I like this right here. When it's the home folks on a Sunday night and there's no visitors... We'd crank that thing all the way up. We'd say, let the Holy Ghost have his way. Let, let Neil go running and knock over three pews. Let Brother Gary fall out. Let uh, Brother Randall back there go to shouting and grab the mic and say, I got to testify. Let it all break loose on Sunday night. But on Sunday morning, we have visitors come. Let's, let's turn that down a notch. Let's make sure we don't get a little crazy. 
I'll admit a while ago when I was going half nuts, I thought, man, this is Sunday morning. And then I thought, oh, well. Turn it up. <laughs> so we've got to make sure that we understand this. You cannot turn on or turn off God. Now, can I allow him to work through me or not? Absolutely. But I can't control the Holy Ghost. I can't say, okay, here's a good time, Holy Ghost. I need you to take over the praise team, knock them all out. Let the keyboard keep playing by itself and let the drumsticks keep hitting. Oh, this is a time for healing, God. I feel like I just want I, my, my uh, wife or my husband's going through a sickness, so, Lord, this has got to be a healing service. I know, I know you're wanting to talk about deliverance, but no, I say it's a healing service. I'm turning off deliverance. I'm turning on healing because I'm controlling the river. You can't. Can't do it. He said he'd flow through you like a river. He said a river on purpose instead of a pond. <laughs> because a pond can be stared at and it can be kind of confined and we can go when we like it and not, but a river makes its own. Ooh, I, I said a river makes its own path. And when it does, you can't control it. Mm. Hallelujah. I like stepping out of the Caucasian ministry ever so often. God is an overflow. God. John 10, verse 10, Amplified Bible. The thief comes only in order to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that they may have, this is Amplified, have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I've spoken to many of you lately who have described to me this scripture. You said that in your own lives, you're feeling something changing. Whoo, glory to God. There he is again, Sister Deanna. You're telling me you're feeling something changing in you. You're starting to feel the presence of God in times of the day you don't normally feel him. You're starting to get woke up at night, and you're feeling him shake you to go to the prayer room and begin praying. Something's happening in you. I'm come to tell you this morning. That for those who have told me that, it's about to get stronger. But for those of you who have not felt what I just described, if you'll open yourself up to God, you're going to begin feeling God in a greater measure this very year. Hallelujah. How do we know that the widow experienced overflow? This scripture won't be on your screen. But it's verse 7 of 2 Kings chapter 4. Then she came and told the man of God. This is after God did the miracle. And he said, go sell the oil and pay the debt. Now, man, I'd have just ran out the door right then if I was in Elisha's house. And I said, thank you, praise God, I'm going to pay the debt. And I would have had me a great time in the Lord. But I'm so glad she didn't run out of the room. Because there was something extra that the prophet wanted to tell her that involved overflow. Whoo, glory to God. He said, pay the debt and whoo, live thou and thy children of the rest. You see, that's the kind of way God moves in us. She started out saying, God, all I want, all I think I need is for you to pay this debt off. But what she didn't know is probably six months down the road, she'd been in another debt. She'd probably had to borrow something else. She'd needed help. Maybe her sons were at an age they couldn't work. I don't know that. But God knew ahead, and you know what Elisha told her? He said, hey, don't just pay that debt. But God's going to give you enough money to spare for you and your sons to live on. Can I give you a prophetic word this morning? God's about to God's about to do such a powerful move of the Holy Spirit in your life that it will overflow into your family. There's some kids about to get saved. There's some cousins of yours who cursed God last week. My God, I feel the prophetic coming on. But God said, I'm about to clean up their mouth and clean up their heart. They're going to become an evangelist. My God, somebody better testify in the next six months of what I just said. Because God's telling me to tell you, don't you dare give up on those people. He said the overflow that's about to happen in you will affect your family. What about my co-workers, Jesus? Is there any way you could go ahead and let them have a little taste of that too? He said, yes, I will. If you'll bring my spirit into your workplace, I'll come in and change their temple. Woo! Somebody's about to become a temple of the Holy Ghost that this past week was a temple of the devil. But somebody new is coming in. There's a Holy Ghost U-Haul about to... There's a Holy Ghost U-Haul about to pull up to somebody's soul in the next few days because you're going to share the gospel and God's going to give them breakthrough and they're going to say, devil, move out. Holy Ghost, move in. 
Woo, my Lord, I thank you for the Holy Ghost. We're going to pour into this city. Not because all of a sudden we experience new growth, even though I hope for that. Not because tithes increases. Not because we go to seminars and we get educated. But we're about to reach a city because somebody in the midst of 60 people who are now in a church, we're not a mega church, but somebody, maybe more than two, three, four, five, are going to grab hold of the vision and you're going to say that my prayer life in the prayer closet when nobody sees me is so important because I've been thinking that maybe it would just affect a little bit. But what God's showing me through this message is when I get in my prayer room, he's about to send overflow to New Haven. He's about to send overflow to the members of this church and those who attend because he knows that God put a mandate on your pastor to pray for awakening. And when people grab hold of that vision with, in connection with your pastor, God says, I will move, I will intervene, and I will overflow out of this church and touch every street in Southside Alabama. I'll get in the schools. I'll get in City Hall. I'll get into the restaurants and the businesses. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Woo! My Lord, I feel him today. I always know when I feel him like this, that Elizabeth and somebody else, Sister Deborah and Sister Laura and some other people have been praying. And I thank you for it. Mm. Recently, I saw an episode of It's Supernatural with Sid Roth. Anybody ever seen that? Great program. You can even pull it up at any time during the week on the Internet. And they'll show you past episodes. There was a man, and I tried to look up his name. Because it's hard to pronounce, but it was something like Pat Schatzlein. There's, I think, different ways to say it. That's about how Sid Roth said it. It's one of the odd names. And that gentleman, was he's a minister of the gospel, and he came on there. He began to talk about a dream that God gave him. He said that he went to sleep one night, and God showed him a map of the United States. And he said, I was on, I was on one side of the country, probably near California. And he said, we ran all the way over this country, him and his wife, and he said there was a huge tidal wave behind us, and we ran thinking that it was going to crush us. And finally, we made our way all the way across the map to the White House, and he said, I ran up and grabbed the columns. Y'all seen those columns before on the White House in Washington, D.C.? He said, I grabbed those columns, and right before the wave hit me, I woke up. He said, I turned and began talking to my wife, and she's, before I could describe my dream, my wife looks at me and says, I just had this dream, and she describes to a T exactly what Pat had seen. He gets up and goes to his prayer room. He says, God, I don't understand. You said uh, after the days of Noah that you'd never uh, destroy the earth with a flood again. And God, I want to read it, so I'll get it word for word. God told Pat, son, what you saw was not judgment. You saw, the, mm, mm, better watch out, Aaron Bowley. You might go to preaching on this one. Well, you saw the next wave of revival, you'll see, that is coming to America, and it will be, listen to this, the final awakening that is coming. That's interesting God used that word, isn't it? Hallelujah. The final awakening is coming to the United States, and you are going to be a part. Woo! You're going to be a part of it. Hannah Morris, you're going to be a part. You're going to be right smack dab in the middle of it. Hope Garner, you're going to be right smack dab in the middle of it because you're one of them prayer warriors that rips the demons to shreds and they hate your guts, but I thank God for it. That woman gets on her knees and starts proclaiming the name of Jesus and devils have to flee. You say, how in the world can that happen? She's so meek and mild. You can't hardly hear her when she gives an announcement in the middle or after service. How could she be a prayer warrior? Because faith is not built on the sound of my voice. It's built on the scream of my heart. And there's some shouters in here who never let out a cry in service. But honey, let me tell you, when they get in the prayer room, God moves, shakes principalities and powers, and demons have to let go of people they were holding on to. Hallelujah. We're on the brink of supernatural overflow of revival. And Satan cannot stop the wave that is coming. Psalm 23, verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. When your jar is experiencing overflow, it spills. 
you have it in your hand and man when something's overflowing you, you notice you try to tiptoe a little bit because you're concerned it's going to spill but sometimes brother neil i can't control it i mean i might hit a bump or somebody might come up to me and say hey brother michael how you doing and it causes me to overflow and spill a little bit see the type of move of god that's coming woo, see if it were us sister Bowley. We would make appointments, and we would say, okay, God, this looks like a good time to minister. This looks like a good place. Oh, I'm in church. Oh, I really feel the anointing today. But, but then, for some reason, we go over to Publix, Colton, and right in the middle of aisle 17, I'm trying to pick out the best green beans in a can. And somebody walks by, and they're crying. And they're, they're having fits with their child in the buggy who's whining. And, and I don't know this, but the mama's going through a situation where her mama's sick and in the hospital about to die. And all of a sudden, you feel God do that. Thinking, wait a minute, God, I, I was in control here. I, I feel like we need to make appointments and make sure that, that I'm dressed up in a suit and tie. Make sure that I can minister and I've got scripture to back me up, whatever I'm going to say. And then God does that. Oh, see, there's something uncontrollable about a river. Oh, <laughs> there's something uncontrollable when you say, God, I want you to fill me up so full that all you got to do is bear. No, you don't have to shake me. You don't have to. My God, I feel him, Brother Ed. You, I don't have to turn you upside down. All I've got to do is just barely nudge you and overflow is going to come pouring out like a river on somebody who's about to give up on life. He wants you so full. All he's got to do is just tap you. See, I used to, Andrew, I used to be such a way that if God was going to use me in the prophetic, use me with word of knowledge. I remember in the early days when he would use me to interpret tongues, he'd almost have to give me a heart attack. I mean, he was shaking that jaw. He was saying, I'm trying to speak through you, Michael. I mean, I'd sit there and I'd say, God, let the pastor do it. God, let my dad do it. God, let mama do it. I mean, I felt like I was about to have to go into cardiac arrest. Somebody was going to call the ambulance. I was about to die. And then all of a sudden, I'd go, ah, and I'd open my mouth, and out it would come. Same way with tongues. When I would uh, give out a message over the church, man, you got a church full of 300 people at City Church, which was Rainbow City Church of God then, make you a little intimidated. And I was sitting there, and God's just a shaking that vessel because I, I wasn't quite full. I, I allowed him to move so much in me, but it was to a point where he had to really shake me to let it come out. But see, as we mature, God begins to fill us more and more, and then all he has to do is, whoo, man, I, this is talking to somebody. <laughs> I guess it's me. And, and all he's got to do, whoo, glory to God, Sister Deborah, is just barely nudge me and nudge you when you get filled with him, and you will realize that you flow so much easier. Isn't that wonderful? Whoo, glory to God. I feel good today. Somebody give him a clap of praise. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, the New Living Translation. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will come on, keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. He said, I want it to grow more and more and more. Don't ever get satisfied with what God's doing through you. Ask him for more. Say, God, use me to do more. I'm willing and I'm ready. The more you pour, you've heard me say this now for about two weeks, the more you pour... God will pour into you. Can you, can you prove it? That's for the little theological scholar that puts their little elementary desk right there and sits there and says, prove it. I'll be glad to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. We're going to read this. I, I hope it's up there. We're going to read this out loud together, class. Here we go. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I just, pro I just proved it. The more you pour, the more he's going to give you back. Mm. There's some mega pourers in this room. There's some people, every opportunity you can get, you look for it. To pour into somebody. And because of that, you're some of the most blessed people. Maybe not in ways that we would consider blessed, but it's ways that God considers blessed. Amen. And he gives you more and more of himself if you're willing to give more of you, more of him to, to others. That's a good God. Amen. So he told us that he would run over in us. The widow woman was exhausted. Had no options. I spoke of that last week. And yet, Elisha points to something that does not make sense at all. 
lady, I want you to go tell me what's in your house. And she said, all I've got is one jar, one pitcher of oil used for anointing based on the direct translation from the Hebrew. Used for anointing. How odd that God would point to something that she had already been holding on to that she had probably passed that morning going out of the kitchen or out of the living room to go find Elisha. There was that jar sitting there and she had no idea that was going to be the key. See, there's callings and gifts upon us that we've had in our, our possession for a long time. And we're saying, God, I want something big. God, I want you to do this. God, I need a, a mountain moved. And God's saying, go back to that calling I put on your life back when you was 13. Wait a minute, God, that can't, I need a word today. I need a prophetic word from T.L. Lowry, Benny Hinn. Somebody, I need somebody big to come. I need to make a call into a TV station and somebody just be led of the Spirit. He said, wait a minute. No, you go back to when you was 13 years old and you was in that old country church. Maybe it wasn't a country church. Maybe it was some mega church. But you go back to that moment. You remember when I put this, put this inside you. Because this is what it's going to take to get your breakthrough today. He's saying there's things that God put in you at a young age. Just like this woman had had that jar sitting on that shelf for a long time. But on this day, she was not going to get to her miracle without going through that jar. Mm. See, God's got callings and gifts upon many of you. That's one of the big things he told me when we started this church was he was going to awaken callings and gifts within people that had lain dormant. He was going to rebuild brokenness. He was going to cause people to be made whole and healed, not just in body, but be healed in mind and soul. And because of our obedience, we've seen hundreds of people that have been saved. We've seen many that have been healed and delivered. And praise God, because of obedience, you sit in this room right here today in a building that I I think used to be a scuba diving gear place or something. But instead, God said, I'll put my spirit in that building. I'll anoint it. I'll shake people loose and I'll set souls free. And because you listen to the word of God, you sit here today and are absorbing more of him so you can pour into this world. Amen. To God be the glory. So the widow was exhausted. But Elisha pointed her to something she would have never expected. I want to try to Finish up today, if that be possible. That would be a good point to, uh, I mean, yeah, if we have one of those flashing signs on the TV shows to flash laugh. I'm going to try to finish on this point. <laughs> I'm going to miss you. <laughs> Thank you for your support, brother. We go to First Samuel chapter 1 about a woman who had to pour. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would make, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. Somebody say double portion. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. If Hannah had been Pentecostal, I'm not going to flash no laughing sign. But she would have probably got the women of the church together and said, we're going to rebuke the spirit of barrenness. I'm going to anoint everything in my house. I'm going to go claim the crib at Walmart in Judea. I'm, I'm going to speak every name I can speak of God and call out God my healer because I rebuke the spirit of barrenness. Now, us Pentecostals are pretty good at that kind of stuff. Man, we can pray with authority. But it's more important whoo, to pray through a discerning spirit and to use wisdom because the devil did not make Hannah barren. God closed her womb. Now, it was only temporary. It wasn't over till God said it was over. <laughs> but you have to be careful what you go around rebuking. Here's your word of pastoral wisdom. Don't go rebuking everything just because it might seem like it's messing up your life. There are some things that God allows to happen so that you can grow. We've got to be careful not to rebuke the things that God's using to mature us. Well, that's just some wisdom just dripping right there. Woo. You get a lot of good word out of that. Verse 7, so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Sister Lori, this is weird to me because I'm thinking, you know, when you go to the house of the Lord, you're on your best behavior. We're churchy. We're going there playing our favorite song. Our preacher's up there preaching a good sermon. Everybody's getting along. 
But for some reason, Penina chose the trip to the house of the Lord as the time to torment Hannah. Oh, that's a little interesting, isn't it? As far as we know, the devil, oh, I'm sorry, Penina didn't mess with her during the year. We don't know for sure. She probably did a little bit. But when they came to a place of worship, ooh, somebody tried to interfere. Because in worship's where we get breakthroughs. In praise is where we realize how big our God is and how nothing the enemy does is going to affect our relationship with the king. Amen. So this woman is desperate for God. She is barren. Her husband loves her so much. And if she could do anything in the world, she would give him a child to say this child is a product of our love, Elkanah. And yet it, God closed her womb. So she comes to the one place, not the doctor, not a psychiatrist, not someone who could read her palm. She goes to the one place where she absolutely believes God can turn things around. And when she gets to that place, she gets attacked. Here comes Penina. Well, you know he don't really love you like he said. Well, you, you know you're, you're not a good wife because you can't give him any children. Look what I've done for Elkanah. I've given him children. Torment over and over and over. Please realize that just because you come to a church that, and, and people pray and the anointing is flowing, please realize the enemy's going to try to distract you. I had that happening to me this morning. Had to get in the prayer room and pray during Sunday school for much of it. I said, Lord, I said, I can only imagine how you distract, I'm sorry, not you, how the enemy distracts all, all the people when here I am, I, I sought and prayed uh, after your face last night. I came here, no distractions. I got up this morning, went to my prayer room, I prayed, and yet here I am so distracted, I can't even hardly think about the message. And I'm thinking, how much more if someone, maybe who didn't invest as much time in prayer? And so it's like the Lord just reminded me that this is one of the biggest places in your life where you're going to be hit with distraction. You're going to be hit with attacks. Can you believe somebody might actually be offended in the church at times? Isn't that amazing? I mean, if they're going to get offended, surely they're going to get offended at the uh, co-worker who curses all day and takes the name of the Lord in vain. Surely they're going to be offended at their TV <clears throat> for uh, showing images of women and men that are, are half-clothed and, and, and sleeping around with everybody. Surely that'll offend them. But no, you let them get to church and they get offended because somebody didn't do what they liked. Isn't that amazing? You can curse God at my work, and I won't get mad at you, but oh, you, lo and behold, you let somebody at the church say something out of the way. Maybe they didn't let me sing my verse. Maybe they didn't let me uh, teach a certain class I wanted, and oh, I'm giving up the victory. Be careful that you do not lower your guard just because you walk through the gates of the house of the Lord. Because the enemy is looking for ways to offend and to distract and to tear you to shreds. But to God be the glory. We have been made more than overcomers by the word of God. Oh, hallelujah. Through the blood of the Lamb, we are going to overcome the enemy. So here's a woman who got desperate. And she had to overcome an attack by a family member. Oh, but Sister Deborah, it's about to get worse. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. That's the location at that time of the, uh, the house of the Lord. And now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost. And I, I misspoke a few minutes ago and said the temple. It's actually the tabernacle. So mark that down. It was the tabernacle, not the temple. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give, to him, give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. I'm going to get it right. Hallelujah. He said, no, she said, no razor shall come upon his head. You know what she was saying? She was saying, dear God, even though this is the most important thing in my life, I'm willing to let it go as soon as you give it back to me. You know one way God's going to bring overflow and awakening and revival through you? is when you say, God, as soon as you speak something into me, as soon as you give it to me, I'm going to be willing to dedicate every bit of it back to you. As soon as you call my son or my daughter into ministry, I'm going to be willing to let them go and, and let you use them. As soon as you call this person, this co-worker of mine, to salvation and they don't come to my church oh I want to get so mad about that guess what I'm going to let them go to the church where God leads them 
because it's more important that I turn over to you what you do instead of me trying to control what you place in my hand. Hannah was saying, God, I want this with everything I've got. But, Lord, as soon as you give me this baby, I'm willing to let go of him and give him to you. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now, Anna spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, oh, here comes the offending preacher. How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away. Now, she had done her best to overcome the attack of Penina. That was tough enough. Had to wait till we got to church to be attacked, but then the preacher gets after her. You old drunk. I mean, wouldn't that be awful? If the Holy Ghost just laid you flat out on the floor and the pastor come up and said, quit your drugs. Quit your drinking. I can almost smell it on your breath. He said, no, that's biscuits from Red Lobster. I can almost smell it on your breath. What you've been drinking, what you've been taking. I mean, how awful to think that even the preacher, the priest, attacks her. Oh, but Hannah wouldn't like most people. <laughs> she was an overflow kind of girl. Verse 15, but Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have, here it comes, poured out my soul before the Lord. Sometimes when you pour, people will not understand you and they will misjudge what God's doing in your life. Well, that's, that's big. Sometimes you're going to feel like, I've said this before, feel like you're, you're on an island. And you're a weirdo. Nobody relates to you. More people relate than you know, but sometimes we feel that way. And yet here was Hannah attacked by Penina, attacked by the priest in, in a way, by accusing her of being a drunkard. And she says, I poured out my soul. Let me explain something to you, preacher. Let me tell you something, Penina. Let me tell you something, husband Elkanah. Let me tell everybody around me, it's not because I've given myself over to wine or intoxicating drink. What's happening to me is because I'm so desperate. I'm pouring out my soul unto the Lord. I want to suggest today that you've never really poured anything unless you poured out your whole soul unto God. Some people say, preacher, you don't know what I gave up. My God, I feel him again. Some people say, preacher, you don't know what I've been through or what people said over me or what I've had to deal with. But God says, look, honey, you ain't ever poured until you got rid of all of it. You ain't ever poured until you let go of the hurt and the pain. You let go of the addiction and the depression. You let go of all those things that tried to destroy your mind. You have never poured until you pour out your soul unto God. What's God telling us to do? What's he begun speaking to us in 2016? He's saying, if you're going to pour, don't you do it halfway. Amen. Don't you just give me the grudge against St. Susie. Give me the grudge against the... Mm, mm, woo. Give me the grudge against them 13 other people that you're going to go to hell about if you don't let it go. In Jesus' name, can I get an amen? He said, don't just pour a little bit out. Don't just pour out some of the hurt you experienced at the last church. Pour out the hurt you experienced at this church. Let it go. Move on. Let God work through you and pour out your soul unto the Lord. I probably would have sat in a room. Now, this is if I didn't have all the knowledge I have now on the New Testament side of things. And I would have sat with Hannah, and I would have really questioned why in the world was she barren. We'd have prayed, sought the Lord. We'd try to get a breakthrough for her. I would have questioned, I don't understand this. But what I would not have known, and you wouldn't have known at that point when she was still barren, is that she would have never poured her soul out without barrenness. Hmm. Think about it. She had had no reason to go to the tabernacle and pour her soul out unless she was barren by the hand of God himself. I know I've already made that point about being careful what you rebuke, but I want to add to that. We need to discern when God is trying to get us to pour everything by using stuff that we hate. Using people that we can hardly tolerate being in the same room with, but God says, I'm all in it. I'm working through them. They don't even know it. They've got a devil on them, but I'm working through them anyway. And they are rubbing against you like sandpaper on wood. And I'm using them to prompt you to get to a place. I'm going admit, to admit something to y'all. Here it comes. Confession. Build a box. Here I go. 
no major thing, but there's times I wouldn't have come and prayed at this church or prayed in Rossi Jane's room, that's my prayer room, or prayed at the playroom at work, that's my other prayer room. <laughs> Hallelujah. Church number one through two, three. There's times I give you my word I would not have prayed like I prayed if I had not been going through something I thought I was going to be crushed over. If God had allowed my life to be just so smooth. Mm -hmm. Sister Laura, salary check coming in every week for Pastor Michael to the full. I, I would have just been riding high. That's just one thing. But there were times God would test me. I'd be thinking, oh, Lord's blessing. We're going to be able to do this and do that. And then next week I'd get slammed at work. Problems on jobs. Somebody not showing up. I remember last year getting caught in a situation that I hated. It's called an audit. Hated it. I was very kind to the auditor. That's probably a good idea. But I got very upset because the individual who did my taxes up until then had misguided me and told me there were deductions I could take. I took her word. She's dead now. I hope she's with the Lord. I do. I won't let her know about some things. She misguided me and let me think that there were certain things we could count as deductions that the state of Alabama didn't agree with her on. Therefore, after working for probably two months straight, some of you knew I was going through this and I was under a load. I spent no telling how many hours trying to go through all my papers. You would not believe the receipts and everything I went through. At the end of the day, she came back with a huge amount I owed and I said, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> Guess what I did? I poured out. I got desperate. I said, God, I don't have that money. So I, I began to hear things in the spirit that God would lead me to find bills and find different paperwork. And he began speaking to me of things that would count as deductions that were legal. We like that. <laughs> I knocked off $1,500 within about two weeks off what she said I owed to the glory of God. Somebody give God praise. <laughs> I still had to pay some money. But what I'm telling you is, if God had not allowed me to be pressed like that and to feel that pressure, and I kept, y'all know, I, I kept coming and preaching. That was around uh, May to June. It felt like July. I don't remember. I kept preaching, kept teaching, kept asking Sister Deborah to have the women pray. <laughs> but I kept doing what I was supposed to do. But I was almost crushed mentally at times because I felt so much pressure. And if not for that audit, your pastor would not have poured out like I did. So in one way, I thank God that I was able to be audited because it pushed me to a place. That sounds so weird because it has nothing to do with spiritual things, but to me, it affected my spirit, man. Yes, and it pushed me into a place where I was going to trust God no matter what they said. Yes, amen. I was going to believe. Matter of fact, I witnessed to the woman. After the audit was done, I sent her an email <laughs> led by the Holy Ghost. And I said, I want you to know that even though, now I don't know word for word, this is close. I hadn't read it in a while. But although I did not like the fact that you told me I owed money, that I thank you for being very professional and working with me in every way you could to help me. Now, I had no reason to try to build her up. It was over. that I wasn't going to deal with her anymore, but I felt led of the Lord. I said, you did an excellent job, very professional. Thank you for helping me in every way that you could. And I just want to speak into your life right now in the name of Jesus Christ that God's got a call on you, that you haven't even begun to see what God's going to do through your life. That, that, and, and I had talked to her a little bit about church in the midst of this audit, and she said, well, I don't really go anywhere. So in the email, I began sharing with her that we've got a church in Southside Alabama by the name of New Haven. But I said, if that's not your home, that's fine, but you've got to get plugged in somewhere because God, Jesus, is coming soon, and you've got to hurry up and do a work. She sent me an email back about a week later, real short. Thank you for what you wrote me. That encouraged me. I would have never had an opportunity to pour into an auditor, Sister Brandy, unless I had been audited. God used something that was so uncomfortable, and I hated it. And yet, he said, but I'm going to use what you hate whew, to make you pour. Stand with me. I'm going to use what you can't stand to make you poor. Make you poor. What did God do in Hannah's life? He did exactly what she asked for. He gave her a beautiful baby boy by the name of Samuel. 
who grew up to be a tremendous prophet that anointed both Saul and David as king of Israel. What a mighty man of God he was. What a great prophet. Samuel would have never been born, though, unless there was a mama who was barren by the hand of God and forced to pour. She had to make a choice. And so have you. You say, man, I'm starting to understand a little bit better now why I've been through what I have. I hope so. Because a lot of times it was the hand of God instead of the devil you thought it was. God was saying, I'm the one putting the squeeze on you. Because I'm forcing something to be pushed out of you that would have never happened without this mess. Would you bow your hands? Hmm. Lord, you have spoken to some people today in amazing ways. Hmm. I believe you're ready to pour more into many of these. God, who have felt empty and void. Spirit of the living God, I ask right now that where they stand. God, they don't even have to open their mouths and speak a word because you see the heart. And Lord, right now, where they stand, if they are opening their heart to you, yeah, somebody's doing that. Oh, I feel it. Mm. It's almost like I can see God begin to open, turn over this vat in heaven, this pitcher, and he's starting to pour something into somebody in this room. Mm. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for being willing to listen to what God's saying. Thank you for receiving it right now. Heavenly Father, just go ahead. I pray you'll do a complete work in them. Lord, as they open their heart to you, yes, Lord. Woo, Lord, I wish I could say their name, but you won't let me. Thank you, God, that you're doing it right this second. And you're letting them know how much you love them. So I won't point anybody out. Go ahead and open your eyes. Would everybody just raise your hand and receive? I'm not going to point anybody out. God knows. He sees your heart. Would you just receive from the Lord right now? It's not just for one person. Uh, I like raising my hands because it's saying, God, I surrender. My God, I surrender to your will. And right now, God's pouring into somebody in this building. I can see it as plain as day. He's doing a healing work. There's some trust issues there where people didn't trust preachers. Somebody didn't trust the move of the Spirit because they'd seen fate. Somebody didn't... Re- mm, Jesus. My God, let me... Uh. There's somebody in this room who can't hardly trust men because of what they've done to you, but God says, I'm healing that. I'm moving over you like hot oil, getting into those cracks that have been rigid, crusty, like chapped skin during the winter. It says, I'm putting my lotion of the Holy Ghost in you. Woo, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I'm glad God's not embarrassing anybody. He's just speaking, and you know who you are. He's such a gentle God. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the healing work, for the pouring work. That God, these who you're mending and you're making them whole, Lord, they're going to pour more than they ever have in their lives. We give you thanks for your word today and I pray you will come with us tonight and anoint the service Lord's praise team singers minister to these families Lord who have lost loved ones in the last couple two or three days bring healing and comfort to them we pray Jessica's family Jessica Fugit's family Lord Casey Hughes any others Lord Brandy I believe had lost a loved one also I pray God you move in their families heal those hearts God and we give you thanks in Jesus holy name Amen. In dismissal, I want to remind you of an email that I sent out. Uh, we've got two families in prayer. I mentioned Jessica, her uh, grandmother passed away. We're going to take up an offering to help them. Uh, and I know you can only do what you can, so just just let God use you today. No matter what you're able to give, God will bless through it. And then tonight, we're going to help uh, Casey's family. Miss Strawn, who uh, came here many times when she was physically able, Gene Strawn, uh, we want to bless them as they're facing uh, some financial hardship due to the loss of a family member that God will use us to help them along with others. So if you will today as you exit, just put something uh, into the basket and we'll bless the families and then tonight we'll do the same.